Welcome. It's Friday. It should be Friday almost everywhere. If anybody is experiencing a Saturday, um, let us know in the chat. Um, I know time zones are wild. Um, so good to have you all here. Um, as you know, I'm Ryan. I'm here with Bashire, um, our Irrational Lives fellow, and Lisa's waiting in the wings to um, blow your minds with design hacks to increase your user motivation. Um, but uh, if anybody has any pressing things, please let us know in the chat. Otherwise, in the chat, let us know where you're coming to us from today. We always love to see where in the world people are coming from. But welcome. It's great to have you here. It's Friday, April 26th here in the United States. Um, Lisa, are you in Boston today or New York today? I am in Boston. Awesome. That's right. Cool. So we've got Boston. Um, I'm in the Chicagoland area, but we're thinking Pacific. For those of you that don't know, um, we're Rational Labs. We've worked with hundreds of top organizations to bring the behavioral design approach into processes. If we were superheroes, we are not. But if we were superheroes, um, our origin story would start by building the Behavioral Economics Unit at Google, where we worked with over 25 teams to infuse BE all across the organization. We've run hundreds of experiments um, with companies. You can read about those at our case studies page. Um, I'm sure uh, we will drop that link in short order. And yes, we've trained thousands of people um, in behavioral economics. Some of the organizations we've worked with are above in the little light blue band there. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there are all kinds of ways to use behavioral design and behavioral insights to innovate and grow. It starts with one product design. By the way, this is worthy of a screenshot if you're feeling screenshotty. Um, you know, it can help you change behavior around a product. Um, you can obviously do training with your organization and you can build out AI strategies. This is what most people engage with us for um, in our consultancy. But Let's talk about the real thing. No, wait, hold on. I actually think we should talk about, should we talk about, I'm just having a moment. I feel like this slide comes before introducing Lisa. I'm just having a moment, everybody. So let me course correct. Before I introduce Lisa, um, oh, maybe this is actually for after the event. Never mind. This is for after the event. So boom, it was correct and I was incorrect. Lisa, though, is the most correct. So Dr. Zavall is a behavioral scientist and research consultant with a broad, huge, massive expertise in behavioral economics, consumer behavior, and social psychology. Her work has been published in an array of prestigious academic journals, including, wait for it, Psychological Science, PNAS, and Nature, colon, Climate Change. That, by the way, is a great article. I'll try and find it and share it. Um, and she's also appeared in numerous media outlets, such as the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Scientific American. Lisa holds her doctorate in judgment and decision-making psychology from Columbia University in the city of New York, and she has an appointment there as well, where she has taught judgment and decision-making courses and research methods. Um, with that, um, you know the drill. Today, we're going to be talking about the seven product design hacks to increase user motivation. So please give up your best emojis for Lisa Zavall coming to us live from Beantown. Thanks, Ryan. I always love your introductions. That's, um, that's why I'm here. That's why they gave me the huge signing bonus. I mean, tens yeah. of millions of dollars. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to poke chat up so that I can um, engage with you all sort of while I'm giving this presentation. I'd love for it to be interactive. So please feel free to throw your questions, um, comments in the chat. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a question. It can be an anecdote, or maybe you want to hop, hop off mute and, and tell me how a particular strategy um, that you've leveraged um, and whether that's worked for your customers and how it has. So really excited to, to hear from you all kind of during this conversation. Um, and I'm really excited to get to talk to you all today about what motivates us, what drives us to action. Um, and by delving into the psychology of motivation, my goal is that you're going to leave here today with some insights that are going to help you craft product experiences and services um, that are going to inspire and engage your users, right? Ultimately, with the goal of helping um, to drive outcomes such as adoption, um, conversion, and retention. Um, and so I really want to start with the basics. 
right? So human motivation can be a really tricky thing for us to corral. So just full disclosure, I probably spent about 45 minutes working on this slide and just thinking about what I wanted to say to introduce this presentation. And I just found myself getting really distracted. I was tinkering with the picture and the gradient. I was checking Slack when I didn't really need to be doing that, right? I was deciding to respond to non-urgent emails. But this, this slow pace, uh, it wasn't really out of confusion and it wasn't really out of indecisiveness, but rather truly it was just a battle with with waning motivation right and and this can be a very real challenge um that probably sounds familiar all too familiar to all of you right so why is motivation so elusive right why can it often feel so fleeting and why do we get motivated to do anything at all um so understanding this is crucial, especially in product or service design, where motivating us users can really determine the success of a product. Um, motivation, it's not just a random occurrence, it's, a, it's vital, it's a complex interplay of our, um, our neurochemical processes and our environmental cues and our personal needs. And at its core, motivation really arises when neurochemicals like dopamine, they're surging in anticipation of something significant, something beneficial that our brains think is about to happen. And this anticipation, it's often triggered by these very subtle cues in our environment, which our brains then interpret as signals to act. And any piece of information in our environment can serve as this cue to motivate us. So how do we get this dopamine really flowing? And this is really what we're going to be covering um, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, we're going to start by deconstructing some of the more traditional views on motivation. We're going to be exploring why motivation is more complicated than the traditional carrot approach, right? And why these models around monetary incentives can sometimes fall short or even backfire. Next, I'm going to be introducing several key behavioral strategies designed to engage users. And specifically, I'm going to focus on this question of how we motivate people to take action on a present behavior that has longer term benefits that are delayed in time. And finally, um, we're going to delve a bit into gamification which is a really powerful tool in your behavioral design arsenal. And I'm going to outline various gamification strategies that can be used to incentivize users, right? Again, ensuring engagement, sustained interest um, in your design. Now, our typical assumption about motivation, it's often framed around this idea of external rewards or incentives. So, our intuition is that people are kind of like Matt's rats in a maze, right? Or, or Pavlov's dogs responding to stimuli. If you've ever taken any intro psych course, you've heard about this sort of classical conditioning where a salient incentives leads to a spike in our dopamine, which then triggers this desired behavior, right? So this model suggests a very straightforward, almost mechanical response to rewards. However, um, the reality is that it's a bit more nuanced than simple stimulus response framework. And we need to consider not only the immediate effects of extrinsic rewards on our behavior change, but also their longer term implications and how this reward might impact perceptions of the product or service itself. So, one-time incentives, like monetary rewards, can certainly provide a temporary boost in motivation. So if you're looking to drive a one-shot behavior change, one-shot action, yes, certainly that can, can potentially be very effective. However, if your goal is to create lasting behavior change or drive a repeated sustained behavior, right, or perhaps even the development of a habitual behavior, you're probably going to need to rethink your strategy. So take a look um, at these charts on the right, and these illustrate this very complex relationship between extrinsic incentives and long-term behavior change. So displayed here, these are outcomes from four different healthcare interventions. 
And they're showing a pretty depressing trend. It kind of looks like a, a roller coaster ride where there's this initial spike in healthy behaviors when a monetary incentive is being offered during the intervention, right? Like giving someone money to quit smoking. And yet, over a period of several months, there's this notable decline back towards baseline behavior once the incentive is removed, right? And the authors of this of the study call this the triangular relapse pattern over time. So why does this happen? Why do monetary incentives sometimes backfire, right? There are a few reasons for this. Um, does anyone, anyone in the crowd have a sense? Why, why might this backfire? Not to put you all on the spot. Has anyone read any studies on this? Why giving someone money to do a task that you take away the money, why would that potentially backfire? It can decrease their intrinsic motivation. Exactly, thank you all. Yeah, so psychologists have demonstrated that extrinsic rewards, such as monetary incentives, can sometimes crowd out intrinsic motivation for repeated behaviors. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about a really interesting experiment that demonstrates this concept pretty powerfully. So I want you to imagine this. Uh, the CEO of this high-tech manufacturing company um, is facing a challenge. He wants to motivate his employees to assemble these intricate um, chips more quickly. Um, and so in an effort to boost employee productivity, he proposes this idea of a short-term bonus to get them to be more productive. But the question arises, what kind of bonus is going to be most effective at motivating his employees to be more productive? Um, now, in this lively work setting, a group of uh, intrepid, intrepid researchers decide to work with the CEO and explore the impact of different types of incentives or bonuses on employees' activity and productivity. And they tested four distinct incentives. One was cash, $25 bonus. Another was a family meal voucher for pizza, which equates to about $25. The other was verbal rewards. They knew they were gonna receive some praise from the CEO. Um, and um, the other was uh, the option. Employees had the option to choose between money or a food voucher. So in the chat, I'm gonna ask for a poll here. Which incentive do you think increased productivity the most in the immediate term? Which of the, these do you think was most successful? Yep. Okay, I'm seeing a spread of responses um, and that's good because this was really a, a trick question because you're, you're oops, sorry, you're all wrong. They were all, relatively equal, surprisingly, right? So I see a lot of people were th thinking about that extrinsic incentive, um, but really uh, approximately all of these bonuses were equally good at lifting motivation. All types of bonuses increased performance by a bit over 5%. But more interestingly is what happens to productivity after this intervention when these incentives are removed. And what we see is that when bonuses are removed, productivity levels among employees who received the monetary bonuses and the meal voucher, the extrinsic incentives, that drops below their performance from day one of the intervention, right? So worse than baseline. And in contrast, the verbal reward and the choice condition, which provided a sense of autonomy and recognition, did not lead to a decline in productivity after the reward was removed. Okay, so why did this happen? Again, when external rewards are introduced, people can sometimes shift their focus from the intrinsic value of the activity, right, of doing a good job in your work, for example, to the external reward. And they start to associate their motivation and their engagement with the reward rather than inherent interest in the task itself. So this can shift um, and diminish their intrinsic motivation. And this outcome suggests a bit of a motivational pitfall associated with extrinsic rewards. So once these tangible incentives are taken away, 
people are going to feel less motivated than they were before the incentive was introduced, right? So as a result, I, I know I have to be very careful with bribery when it comes to how I use candy with my children, right? Is that going to be a good incentive or is that going to backfire once I take that candy away, right? Again, this type of incentive really needs to be managed uh, pretty carefully. Okay, so let's think about why else monetary incentives can sometimes backfire. So besides crowding out intrinsic motivation, can you think of a reason, for example, why giving someone a monetary incentive like a discount, right, like a product discount could potentially backfire? Any thoughts there? Makes the relationship more transactional. Devalues the perception of the product. Yeah, Ben, that is what I was thinking about, but it does make the relationship um, a bit transactional. And that has to do with this um, slide as well. So monetary incentives in the form of deals or discounts, they can sometimes create this unwanted consequence of eroding a product's value in the eyes of consumers. And I'm gonna demonstrate this interesting finding using results from another interesting experiment. So in this study, researchers invited participants into a lab to test what they were told was a new pain relief medicine. And spoiler alert, it was actually just a placebo. It didn't actually relieve any pain. And each participant received two electric shocks to set the baseline for their pain experience. And then they were given this pain relief pill to see how it would affect their perception of pain. But here's the twist. Half of the participants were informed that each pill cost $2.50. And meanwhile, the other half were told that the pills did originally cost $2.50 but they had been slashed down to the low, low price of just 10 cents per pill. So what do you guys think happened? Did the price impact whether people thought this pain relief medicine worked? Try to imagine yourself in this situation. Do you think this would have an impact on your perception of pain? It sure did. So when participants were asked if the pill helped relieve their pain from the electric shock, 85% of participants who were told the pill cost 250 did report some pain relief compared to about 60% in the discount group. So just a, a, a extraordinary example of how effective a placebo can be, first of all. But what does this really mean for us? It's that the way that consumers perceive quality as a reflection of price can have real actual effects on how we perceive or experience a product. So specifically, when we're going to use a monetary incentive or discount to mark something down, the perceived quality can also sometimes go down. Now, just as a, a quick aside, there are a few behavioral strategies that we can leverage to mitigate these kind of negative perceptions, right, when offering a discount. This is a hard question, but can anyone guess what those are? What might we do when offering a discount that would reduce this negative consequence. Any thoughts while I take a sip of water? Lovely, Brian. Yep, that's one. Urgency, right? Time is running out. What else? I'm thinking about something else. Yes, Corey, exactly. Exclusivity and scarcity. Yes, or you could make it a less obvious discount. Ed. That's an interesting idea, but I'm really thinking about exclusivity. So if you say this is a special discount, um, this is an exclusive discount, we don't offer that many of these discounts because this is such a special right product or service, that can kind of act to counteract the negative effect of a discount. Um, also, if it's a product that someone's very familiar with and has used before, that can also lessen any negative impact of a discount. So the take home message here really is that monetary incentives aren't always a silver bullet. So while they can provide this initial boost, their effects can often be diminished when the incentive is removed, right? They can unintentionally reduce intrinsic motivation for repeated behaviors and sometimes even lower the perceived value of a product depending on how it is framed. 
So with these questions and these ideas in mind, I'm going to shift our focus for the remainder of the presentation to explore some non-monetary strategies, right? What are some alternative ways we can, we can really motivate people to do the hard thing? Before I do, I just want to pause. Any questions or comments so far? And you can feel free to hop off mute if you'd like to ask directly. I thought Luis made a great point. Um, probably that's why Apple barely offers any discounts. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. And there's there's probably a lot of other um, stores or organizations you know where discounts is actually something um, that's that's really prevalent. But it's okay because they're not driven by the perceived quality of their product or service. Um, so yeah, keep, continue to feel free to, to, fro, to throw those comments and questions in the chat. I'm going to keep reading them and, and I can pause. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to discussing non-monetary incentives, which can really tap into deeper, more sustainable drivers of behavior. So now I'm going to just circle back to that first slide of this talk. Moments of motivation to do something hard. And by hard, I mean like eat healthier, stop smoking learn a new language, file your taxes, make that doctor's appointment, those moments of motivation can be quite fleeting. And when we're not feeling particularly motivated to do something, we tend to procrastinate and push these challenging tasks to some indefinite point in the future. So why do we do this? I bet a lot of you know this. What is the name of this cognitive bias that pushes us to delay tasks that we find less immediately gratifying. Who remembers? Anyone know this cognitive bias? There we go. I knew you guys Present knew it. Bias. Present bias. Yes. Anyone who's been at any of our other workshops um, shouldn't should have <laughs> should have that one. Lisa, um, you, you were supposed to give cash rewards. You would have got a quicker answer. Oh, that's right. But then I thought that would stop people from yeah. continuing yeah. to comment at the next, you know, <laughs> webinar that they that they go to in the future. Um, yeah. So this is actually perhaps one of the most well known biases in behavioral economics, and it's sometimes referred to as hyperbolic discounting or myopic thinking or even procrastination. But basically, this bias shows that people tend to put an unrealistically high value on the here and now, on their present self, and an unrealistically low value on the future and their future self, right? We discount the future. And we're, motivate, we're motivated by things that are gonna grant that instant gratification due to present bias. And if you've ever been to one of Irrational Lab's workshops previously, you've probably seen this slide before. And really it's just showing that we're gonna be most motivated by things that benefit us immediately, versus anything that's delayed in time. Any delay in perceivable benefits is gonna lead us to devalue that benefit. Lewis, I'll come back to that question. Now you're talking about sort of um, a state trait of self-control or impulsivity, which is a, a little different. But yes, there are certainly some really interesting individual differences that impact our hyperbolic discounting rates. Someone who has a... Um, and, and these are measurable traits. So someone who tends to procrastinate more or has a higher discount rate, um, maybe more impulsive or less self-control, we're going to see differences in the types of benefits that that person, that person needs. So yes, there are absolutely personality or individual differences when it comes to present bias that have been well studied. Um, and so, Instead of trying to overcome present bias, which is nearly impossible to do, right? It's really hard for us to overcome this really powerful natural instinct. Let's lean into it. So if we're trying to motivate users to do something hard now, right? Like exercise, but it has delayed benefits like improved long-term health, we need to use strategies that make the results of our action feel more immediate. So next, I'm gonna introduce you to three motivational strategies that are really designed to do just that. So the first involves creating a visual or a narrative representation of progress towards a longer term goal. 
It really helps bridge this gap between today's action and tomorrow's benefits, and it's really used to make the goal feel closer and more tangible. The second strategy has to do with artificially bringing the finish line of the end outcome closer, making it feel like the end is near. And the third type is, um, the third strategy is a type of reward substitution, where we're substituting in a more immediate benefit for that longer term benefit. And I'm gonna be focusing specifically on strategies from the gamification literature that provide that immediate benefit to the user. So let's get into it. We're gonna start with this motivational strategy of displaying or conveying progress. So displaying progress towards completing a behavior is really crucial in motivating all individuals. And when we visually observe our progress, it provides this type of tangible sense of achievement and it's reinforcing our motivation to continue. And this is particularly important due to a phenomenon known as completion bias, which is our drive to finish tasks in order to reduce this sort of psychological tension that's caused by incompleteness. So by leveraging what we know about this bias, we can improve motivation through effective visual or communic communicative representations of progress. So the goal of, and I'm sure you've all seen progress bars and a lot of designs and apps in the past, right? During onboarding experiences, for example, the goal of including these types of progress bars or checklists or completion meters um, is to keep completion rates high as the user is moving from screen to screen. But the way that progress is experienced or visualized is critical. And by the way, if you're interested in diving a little deeper into progress bars and the best way to display a progress bar, I'd suggest you check out this blog post um, that I wrote with Kristen Berman. And in this blog post, we talk about research that shows that when initial feedback indicates rapid progress, quick progress is made initially, we are energized and we are more determined to see things through. However, if the initial progress you're making is slow and it's revealed to be slow, this can lead to feelings of discouragement, causing people to abandon effort altogether. Right. So again, if feedback shows slow initial progress, users are more likely to give up. Thanks, Ryan, for throw. Oh, thank you guys for throwing that in there. So to boost motivation, you're going to want to engineer an immediate sense of accomplishment for your users. So for instance, during the onboarding process, you could introduce really simple, quick wins, right? What are some easy tasks you could give your users, like a straightforward to-do list or um, a clear initial milestone, right? Provide them with a simple, easy task right off the bat um, to then help exceed their expectations of how fast this is gonna be to really boost initial confidence. Um, so uh, another, um, really important motivational strategy is how we frame and how we reward progress. And it's often more effective to reward users for incremental achievements rather than waiting to celebrate um, only the final outcome. Um, and this approach helps sustain motivation by acknowledging the effort and the progress, not just the end result. Um, of the um, of the action that the user is taking. And Noom does this really nicely, right? So this is a popular weight management app. And you can see they use a system called Noom Coins to reward their users. However, instead of only rewarding their users when they reach their target weight, Noom awards these coins for actions like just taking a regular weigh-in or achieving this very small progressive milestone. Okay, so again, this method of rewarding incremental progress rather than just the final outcome is going to help keep users engaged and motivated in this example through their weight loss journey. Now, there's another really interesting way to reward um, continual progress. 
Um, it's a popular gamification strategy, and that's by motivating users to complete a streak. And this approach motivates users to take this small, continuous step towards the larger goal. So the idea being that each day, for example, that a user makes progress by maintaining this streak, they're going to build momentum, staying motivated. And it's really this thrill of not breaking that streak that becomes a powerful driving force. And I just want to show you quickly results from an interesting study to just drive this point home about how effective continual progress can be to motivate us. So this was an interesting research study. Um, imagine that you're a participant in this study and you're told you're gonna just be sitting at this computer for 20 minutes. And while you're just sitting there and you're just earning your participation fee that you're paid, you're told that you get to choose what you do on the computer while you're sitting there. And here's your choice. You can either complete a bunch of CAPTCHAs while you're sitting there, which is- um, Is anybody else having an audio issue? Hello, hello? No, I'm good. It's just no, you. I, it hello. might just be me. You're back. Okay, I thought that was a, a test of some kind. Good, good. Um, I thought you were really uh, comfortable with this research study here. Um, so yeah, so you can either sit at the computer and complete a CAPTCHA, which is very boring, or you can choose to do something a little more fun. You can watch some funny videos. But if you choose to do the CAPTCHA task, you get rewarded. And each time you complete this boring CAPTCHA, you get a bonus of 70 cents. So you could complete the CAPTCHA, get 70 cents, then watch a funny video, complete another CAPTCHA, watch another funny video, complete another CAPTCHA, and you're, and you're getting these bonuses of 70 cents, fine. But some participants are put in a different experimental condition called the streak rewarding condition. And these folks are paid for choosing to complete CAPTCHA tasks consecutively without any videos in between. And they receive a lower reward for the first CAPTCHA they complete, and then a higher amount for the second and the third CAPTCHA they complete in a row. But if they break this streak and watch a video, they return back to that lowest amount for the next CAPTCHA task. So which condition do you think worked best in motivating people to complete more CAPTCHAs? It should be the group one, right? Because they just make more money. But yeah, Lewis, it's, it's number two. Results showed that the streak rewarding payment method encouraged participants to complete more CAPTCHA tasks than that larger flat incentive, even though the flat incentive was larger. So incentivizing people or consumers to initiate streaks can increase persistence in effortful tasks. And again, why are streaks so motivating? One reason is that seeing progress is naturally reinforcing to us, and we don't want to lose progress that we've already made. Any questions so far? Sandra, number four and five CAPTCHA, what was the 70? Do you want to hop off mute and ask your question? Did the reward increase every time? I think it did. I can't remember. I'd have to reread the study to see if what happens after that third, does it keep increasing to 80 cents or do they start back at 50? I would assume it, it increased to 80, um, but I would have to double check the study. Um, Ed says, is it as simple as loss aversion? So not wanting to lose what you have gained. Yes, that's a huge component of, um, of a streak. Um, and Duolingo actually does a really nice method where they give people the option to skip a day so that they don't lose the streak because of that extreme loss aversion. Some users actually don't like participating in streaks. So it is this nice combination of seeing continual progress being made and that loss aversion, that thrill of not wanting to break the streak. Is there an upper limit to streaks? People can become quite disillusioned as they stop learning, but maintain the streak through learning through the day. Um, Jill, do you want to hop off mute and clarify? 
Yeah, sorry, that was really badly worded. Oh, so things okay. like Duolingo. So obviously people get to like 100 days of streaks and they keep learning, they keep going back to it because they don't want to break the streak. But at some point, you know, people will just like ping through something really quickly. And with things like Duolingo, you kind of reach an attrition point in your kind of learning journey and people start to get a bit disillusioned. So I was, I, I mean, I find that specifically with people with Duolingo. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if there is kind of an upper limit to that in terms of how motivating it is yes absolutely so with everything if we keep just leveraging the same behavior behavioral strategy over and over and over eventually it is going to lose that impact i think duolingo is a very is an outlier in that it actually does allow someone to maintain a streak for 300 days and, and more i don't know if i can think of another app um, that lets people maintain that type of streak but you can just see how long that strategy is effective for um, but yes, like almost any behavioral tactic, when repeated, um, it's going to start to lose to lose that impact. Oh, Snapchat. Yes, yeah, Andrea, I've heard that. I haven't seen it. <laughs> um, great questions. Keep them coming. Okay. Um, so why else um, is, let me, let me see if I have time to do this part. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me see. Okay. Um, so let me just, yeah, I think I have time. So just to recap, displaying progress matters and rewarding progress matters um, to motivate people to continue to persist when they're performing a difficult action. But let's take this one step further. Let's not only make users feel like they're making this progress and fast progress, but let's think about how we could give them the impression that they don't have much further to go, that the end is near. And this approach leverages the psychological effect known as the goal gradient effect, where motivation increases as the perception of the remaining distance to the goal decreases. So by making it seem as though the finish line is just around the corner, we can significantly boost persistence and effort. So just think about yourself for a moment. Have you ever noticed that you're much more motivated to complete an assignment at work when it feels like you're almost done with it, right? Do you tend to finish the last item on your to-do list faster than the first or the middle items? And if so, you're not alone. This is a tendency, again, the goal gradient effect. And this effect shows that people will work harder and accelerate their behavior to achieve a goal as they get closer to reaching it. And when feedback shows that a user only has a few steps left, they're more motivated to power through. And this is why, for example, it's much more effective um, if you're designing, again, an onboarding flow to move a very complicated task for the user towards the end of that flow rather than place it at the beginning. And this also leverages a, a bias known as the sunk cost effect. And one study that really showed um, the power of goal proximity on user behavior um, is one that was done using Kickstarter, right? So in this study, researchers analyzed data from 10,000 different Kickstarter crowdfunding projects. And they wanted to figure out what factors of a Kickstarter project are going to impact whether or not people decide to donate to it. And they looked at the impact of seven key variables of Kickstarter projects. So one was the percentage of the goal was funded, how much was left to go. They looked at goal size, they looked at days in the funding cycle, how much early support they had, social influence, total backers, um, com competition, what other projects were there, um, and, and, and how many funders there were, for example. And what they found was that the factor that had the greatest impact on giving was percent of the goal that was already funded. And people were much more motivated to help and donate if they believe that their contribution is going to make a tangible difference. So take a look at this figure for a moment, right? People are more likely to donate when they perceive that the end goal is within reach, that their actions are going to really make that difference. So just look at the number of backers, for example, who are donating when the project is close to 99%. 
And we see this tactic used a lot um, in charitable giving, especially, right? So um, let's think about how we could translate this into product design. So for example, when feedback shows that a user only has a few steps left to do, right? They're gonna be more motivated to power through. A long unfilled progress bar or a completely empty checklist is going to backfire. It's gonna act as a deterrent and it's gonna prevent users from jumping in. A related strategy to making the finish line um, feel closer, by the way, is to break, um, I think someone asked, how do you hack this? If you have a really big task, it's best to break it into smaller tasks or smaller mini milestones so that the overall finish line doesn't feel so distant, right? So they, they feel like they're reaching the end of a goal more continuously. So here's a really interesting um, strategy. This is one of my favorite strategies in behavioral science, I think, to make the finish line feel closer. It's a great tap, a uh, great hack. So imagine you're visiting a brand new coffee shop down the street in your town or city, and they give you a loyalty punch card. I think we've all, we're all familiar with these. And it, the idea is buy 10 coffees and you get one free. But now imagine that they give you, they give you a different loyalty punch card. And there's a subtle design tweak here. You still have to purchase 10 coffees to get one free, but now you get two holes pre-punched, right? The number of coffees you need to purchase looks like it goes up to 12, right? But it seems like you've already made some initial progress, right? So which version of the card do you think is going to be more motivating to buy you for, to get you to buy the coffee? Really think about yourself in this situation. Yeah, right? I've, look how far I've gone. I've gotten two punches already, right? And that's what results show, right? Customers who receive a 12 stamp coffee card with the two pre-existing bonus stamps completed the 10 purchases faster than customers who received a regular 10 stamp card. And this is a great example, by the way, of our, what we call our irrationality, this type of bias, right? Because rationally, these are both exactly the same, but we're leveraging what we know about human psychology and what motivates us to change and drive our behavior. Um, and this particular effect, what I just showed you, of giving someone a sense of false progress um, behavioral scientists refer to this as endowed progress, right? And it's this idea that if you provide some type of artificial advancement towards a goal, a person is going to be more motivated to complete that goal. And the strategy also taps into, again, the psychological principle of sunk cost bias, where um, users tend to be very hesitant to abandon finishing a task if they feel that they've already invested some effort into it using like the foot in the door technique, right? So sometimes our psychology can be a little too invested in not wasting what we've already put in. This is another reason why endowing someone with some initial progress is gonna be a super effective strategy. Um, and just one example of how we might leverage this concept of endowed progress in everyday um, product design, the best onboarding um, processes that I've seen provide users with some sense of an artificial head start. Um, so this is Evernote and on the get started page, Evernote has already shown something as being crossed out for me, right? I already created my first note, right? So I, maybe I already signed in, I already engaged in the free trial, right? We never wanna start showing the user that there's a blank state ahead of them, okay. So to recap, feeling like we've made fast progress motivates us, knowing that the end is in sight motivates us. Another way, very different way, to lean into present bias and to try to tip the scales in favor of our future self is to replace long-term delayed benefits with ones that feel more immediate to us. Right? We can be motivated to overcome procrastination when offered an immediate benefit or an immediate reward. But again, we don't necessarily need this benefit or reward to be extrinsic or monetary in nature to drive action. And instead, I'm going to be focusing specifically on different types of gamified in, in, in more intrinsic incentives to make that benefit feel more immediate. Um, but before I get into this, I do just want to mention 
Uh, gamified incentives, while they're, they're fun and they're exciting, they're not effective on their own per se. But different game design elements and tactics can be used to help amplify some level of pre-existing motivation um, to help sustain our engagement to take action. Okay. So research in behavioral science suggests, and this is, I just really want to go a little deeper into the um, the mechanism for why these gamified techniques are so effective. Um, research in behavioral science suggests that many game design strategies work to motivate us because they actually reward very specific basic human needs. Our need to resolve uncertainty, our need to feel competent, and our need for social belonging. So let's start with this first need. So People tend to be motivated to seek information that fills gaps in their knowledge or their experiences. We possess this natural inherent desire and instinct to resolve feelings of uncertainty, even if we expect a negative outcome. So let me demonstrate this for you using a, another pretty extreme example that also involved electric shocks. Um, so in this study, college students, participants, they came into the lab and they were shown electric shock pens that were supposedly left over from uh, a previous experiment. Maybe it was that experiment on the, on the pain pill. And they were told that they could click the pens just to kill time while they're waiting for the real study to begin. And the pens were color coded. Um, the red pens they were told were gonna deliver a shock. Other participants in a different experimental condition, however, they saw 10 pens that all look the same, and they were told five of these pens have batteries and five don't. Okay, now if, if you want, you can feel free to click around these pens and kill time before we start the real study. And in this case, in this condition, the outcome of clicking each pen was uncertain. Yes, so which pens do you think got more clicks? If you were to watch these students, how do you think they're gonna behave? right? Students in the uncertain condition clicked noticeably more pens. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of electric shocks in this research, pretty extreme. I, I don't know how it got IRB approved, but it did. Yeah. So curiosity reigns supreme as this very powerful driving force to motivate us. And it's this very curiosity that we can harness to create these more captivating, engaging user experiences, right? And we can be go beyond clickbait as a, as a means to leverage curiosity, right? Clickbaity, um, but it is can be very effective in messaging titles and headers, right? If you can raise a question in, in the mind of your users and then answer that question. Um, another common way to leverage curiosity, for example, is using locked content. Right. Oh, I don't know what's behind the lock. It's blurred out. We're going to have to take action to see. So by strategically crafting these types of elements, we can really try to pique user interest and entice their motivation naturally um, to want to learn more. Um, but also, by the way, humans tend to be particularly curious to learn more about ourselves. Right. We love to uncover information about what makes us special and unique. And this innate curiosity can be a very powerful tool when designing personalized products that can cater to that curiosity, right? Whether it's fitness or fashion um, or finances, right? How can we show users that we're going to help them discover more about what makes them special, right? And it can be as simple as, um, you know, listen, what is your listening personality, right? Learn more about how your electricity use compares to your neighbors, right? Or you know, you can think of myriad ways that we can kind of leverage people's natural desire to learn more about ourselves to drive action. Okay, so let's dive into another intriguing aspect of human motivation, which is this burning desire to feel competent. And this concept of competence also encompasses our desire for, uh, our desire for what's known as self-efficacy, self-confidence in our ability to tackle tasks um, that bring forth desirable outcomes. So just think about yourself for a second, right? When you truly believe in your capability that you can complete a task successfully, you are gonna be more eager to jump right in and dive into that challenge. 
And gamification has proven to really be a, a game changer in boosting and building confidence. So we've already talked about a few strategies to build user confidence, by the way, right? Displaying fast initial progress is one to really boost initial confidence. Building a successful streak is another. And another prominent game design tactic um, to display user competency, um, you've probably seen before, it's in the, the use of badges, for example. So Uber does this really nicely. This is one of my favorite examples. Um, so this is how um, Uber drivers could, could uh, this was a year ago, I think, so I don't know if this is currently how they're shown. Um, this is how they could view their rider compliments. So did they get a badge for excellent service, for awesome music, for having a cool car? And what I really like about this um, visual display is you can see that some of these badges are grayed out. So this is also an interesting form of a progress bar, right? And leveraging what we know about incompletion bias. We have this desire to complete um, and fill in empty states. So it's really leveraging a, a nice range of behavioral tactics. Um, and a, another overall piece of advice to drive competence and self-efficacy and support the user's feelings of competence, right, is to create tasks that are gonna pose a challenge to your user, right? They're, it's hard to complete, but they should always be perceived as being feasible to fulfill, right? It's a very hard balance about how we decide whether a task for our user is gonna make them feel challenged, but also feel confident that they can do it. And I brought this up because I just want to mention Duolingo does a really nice job of creating tasks for their users, little language learning lessons that are challenging, but definitely manageable for their users. And if you're interested in learning more about this insight, you should check out IELTS podcast on this topic. It's the second episode of the Science of Change podcast. It's about Duolingo's design strategies. It's super interesting. One of my favorite parts is how they used user data to determine what is the right balance between how hard a task should be, right? To maintain motivation, but to avoid drop off. Um, now, another way of fostering competence, by the way, is providing constructive and meaningful positive feedback. And this is different than just displaying progress. We can support feelings of confidence by integrating positive feedback mechanisms that positively inform users about their progress and how well they're doing. Um, and again, ideally, we're designing feedback loops that are timely, that are immediate, and that are rewarding progress versus just the final outcome, right? The final aspect of um, human motivation that gamified strategies can really leverage involves our inherent need for social belonging. And the entire field of social psychology of social psychology is really based on this idea that inherently we are influenced by the behaviors and the actions of those around us. And gamified strategies have this great potential to address this innate natural need for social belonging by incorporating gamified social elements into product experiences, right? You know, products can integrate features that le let users connect, to collaborate, to compete, right? Again, to tap into this desire for social comparison, knowing that we're keeping up with the herd, right? So let's start with this idea of, of comparison. This is a really interesting finding from psychological research to support just how much we're driven by norms and social competition. So imagine that you're part of a group of people who enjoy running, and it turns out that you see that a lot of your fellow runners just decided to run for an extra 10 minutes, right? Knowing this will motivate you to increase your own running time in this experiment by 5.3 minutes. But what's even more fascinating is this effect is strongest when those peers who ran longer used to be less active, right? It, used, it creates this contrast effect where really you perceive yourself as falling behind in comparison to your, to your peers. And this is really motivating to drive behavior change. I'm gonna skip this last study um, to show you just some more concrete examples of, of social belonging. Um, so you know, how can products and services really leverage this insight and bring it into fruition? This is a really nice example um, that moves beyond social competition. This is Headspace, the meditation app, right? Here's just an example of how they're facilitating collaboration and social support. Um, you know, Headspace shows users who else has logged in that day, and it's giving users the ability to nudge others to get going, right? This is similar to Peloton's um, high five feature, if you've ever used that. 
Um, and importantly, I want to stress that we tend to be most motivated by the behaviors of those who we identify with. So in this example, Noom is using a very tailored form of social proof, right? The user has already indicated their age um, and their gender. And now we see that Noom is tailoring their onboarding experience to offer insights about those who share your gender and age group to help motivate someone to sign up. So different game design elements can trigger different motivational outcomes. And by tapping into these different human needs of curiosity, competence, social belonging, we can create these meaningful experiences that not only motivate users, but that can really capture their attention in enjoyable ways, right? Beyond just extrinsic monetary incentives. So with gamified rewards, we're motivating immediate action and effectively substituting immediate rewards, like feeling social belonging, resolving curiosity for a reward that is delayed in time, like having uh, being healthier, right? Saving more finances for the future. So um, to sum up, I, I have a few minutes. Um, today, we've delved into some of the various psychological drivers that motivate us to action. And a reminder that we explored several strategies to counteract present bias by making the future feel closer, right? We explored several of these strategies, displaying progress in a way that highlights rapid advancement, focusing on rewarding progress rather than just outcomes, creating perceptions that your goal is within reach, and providing this sense of early endowed progress and fulfilling these basic human needs for curiosity, competence, and social belonging, right? And I think understanding these mechanisms a little better can really be used to help us design more effectively and deliberately um, in order to really leverage those to motivate true behavior change. Whew, okay, I did it with, with two minutes to spare. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have too much time for question, but I do um, have my email up and I am happy to, to chat with folks if you have a really specific question about a user experience you're engaging in. Um, Ryan, let me let me turn it back to you. I'm sorry, I didn't wasn't able to leave as much time as we wanted, I think, for questions at the end. Lisa, it's absolutely okay because everybody is going, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of emails tonight. You're not going <laughs> to sleep because everyone's going to be at Lisa at irrationallabs.com. They're going to drop incredible questions. It's going to be so torrential, your email inbox, that you're going to have to voice note everybody back. That's what I'm predicting. So get ready. Okay. <laughs> but in the meantime thank you everybody for joining us today and thank you lisa a round of applause for her i always love her presentations because lisa you do such a wonderful job of anchoring in all this incredible resource re, uh, research while giving us great resources and ideas for ways that we can kind of enhance our own products our own projects, and even prod our own loved ones um, <laughs> in fun and motivating ways that don't involve cash incentives. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was just wonderful to see all that today and to see everybody's engagement in the chat. Speaking of chat, um, as you did see, I did put in the chat our kind of end of workshop notes, but let's definitely keep hanging out. Our next event is um, Friday, May 24th with Isabel McDonald. Um, she's going to be talking about pricing. Um, so that's going to be the exciting open event for next month. And then as I put in the chat, if you want to collaborate with us, please reach out to Amy at irrationallabs.com. She's our head of business development. You want to stay in the loop? Most of you are probably on our newsletter, but if you aren't, that's the URL there. And um, people love Kristen Substack. It has grown exponentially over the course of the last year. Um, and if you haven't checked that out, the teardowns are always a massive hit. So definitely uh, make yourself get on that stack ASAP. In the meantime, we'll see you all in May. We hope you're having a brilliant spring for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere and that everybody's staying out of trouble and that you remain intrinsically motivated um, into the foreseeable future because I'm not giving cash incentives um, this month. So take care, everybody, and thanks for spending your Friday with us.